you would give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say. Lord, we pray, God, that we would hear from you. Lord, I pray, God, anything that I would say that's not true, that's not of you, uh, would not take root. Lord, I pray it, uh, it would wither away. Lord, and I pray everything that is sown in truth would not be sown by the enemy. But Lord, it would bring a crop 60, 70, 100 times full. Lord, we just thank you for all these things and we pray for the kingdom come, that your will be done. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, all right. So we are going to session four of the Armor Bearer. Last week we had Nate, but Nate is in Florida. Um, he went over the Old Testament, the Old Testament Armor Bearers. Now we're going to be going through the New Testament and the New Testament Armor Bearers. So uh, if anyone has a volunteer to, uh, to read paragraph A, I will. So far, we have investigated the Old Testament concerning the subject of armor bearing, and clearly defined the duty, role, and service of armor bearer in his Old Testament function. Now let's look more closely at this role of armor bearing in the light of the New Testament. All right. And Lydia, is the, is the next one good for you? Is that sure? Small enough? <laughs> In the life of every Christian, God has established a certain order of priorities. Both the armor bearer and the person he is serving should follow these priorities if they are to live faithful Christian lives. In descending order of importance, these priorities are. Number one, relationship with God. Number two, relationship with spouse. Number three, relationship with children. Four, replace the employment or employment or work. Good. Good. So uh, there's a there's an order of priorities as Christians. Um, we have we have God. Well, actually, God should be first. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have uh, you don't have you know a ranking you know here's here's my God time and here's my spouse time you know um, though you should have time where you have devotional time and time with your wife but you know the Bible says pray without ceasing you know and we can have uh, we can walk with our spouses we can walk with our children we can do all those things. And we can do it unto the Lord so long as we do it with his heart and to glorify him and that we would long to have his kingdom come and his will be done in our relationships. You know, and it's not just a that's not just a, a, a slogan or a saying, it's that I, I can live out the Sermon on the Mount in every relationship I have, you know, by God's grace. Um, that's that's what our, your kingdom come, your will be done, looks like in relationships. It looks like the Beatitudes. It looks like turning the other cheek. It looks like giving when someone else can't repay. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, paragraph C, if anyone wants to read that. <clears throat> Got any volunteers? One of the main differences between armor bearing in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is the fact that in the Old Testament days, the duty of an armor bearer was priority number one. In the New Testament, armor bearing is priority number four. This doesn't this doesn't mean that today's armor bearers is to take less than a necessary care of his responsibilities. His position is a God-given one, and he must be a good steward of that duty. Although the physical roles may have changed, the attitude of the heart must be the same. Amen. So, so we see as in the New Testament is that, and this is, this is very... Um, 
this is a very common one where we're putting the Old Testament and the New Testament together, is we're, we're saying that we function not by the letter of the law, but by the spirit of it. Is why, why the law was made, put there in the first place. Um, and it's the same with the armor bearer. It's the same part that the, the armor bearer had, uh, putting his, his, his very life uh, in, in danger to help support his, his leader or his, his, uh, his king. He would, he would literally put his life on the line. In the same way, we need to have the same part into, uh, into doing it. Now, our lives not being on the line, so to speak, but we can still have that same part and that same passion by God's grace. All right, does anyone want to read uh, paragraph A under Old and New Testament armor bearing contrast? I'd like to say one thing about the Yeah, part. yeah. I mean, it's a, I've always questioned your part about yeah. where you would have seizing, and it's like, how can anybody possibly do that? Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, nobody can possibly do that, but he reads our heart. Right. And so when you're meditating and you're thinking about the Lord, he just, just walks. And that he views that as the same as praying constantly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Old and New Testament armor bearer and contrasted. In the Old Testament, the armor bearer's main function was directly related to combat. Um, this has not changed all, at all between the Old and the New Testaments. What has changed greatly is the type of combat in which the New Testament armor bearers engage as he serves his officer. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against personalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the of wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 12, in this passage, we clearly see that we are not engaged in battle against the Philistines, against flesh and blood, against the demonic powers. Amen. 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 So we don't, uh, as Christians, now in the New Covenant, we don't go into the, the New Age store and, and tear it down and, and kill and slaughter everyone who's New Age. Do we? <laughs> no. But, but here's, here's the thing. is We need the heart of Jesus. And we are fighting spiritual forces in darkness. You know, um, just just like that verse in, in Ephesians says, is our battle. It's not against flesh and blood. There is powers and principalities and, and things that are in the way. If, if, if you have ever talked to anyone who, who's a non-believer and, and you see that that clash of conflicts, and you you you, you can see that there's there's a level where they can't understand. There's, there's not the reasoning because God hasn't renewed the mind. He hasn't, he hasn't brought restoration mm -hmm. to our thinking. So if we're not a new creation, we're going to be thinking in all way. Um, let's do. Uh, here, oh, you have something? Yeah. You know, it's interesting we talk about this because in the last week or so, I've been attacked left and right with principalities, and part of the issue is is character assassination. Yeah, you know, we know who we are in Christ, and so does the enemy. Yeah, so there are times where he comes out as full throttle when we least expect it. This week I got bombarded with accusations of theft and everything else, and not knowing what I was doing at work in the whole nine yards, and yet I had people that knew me and my character that defended me, which wasn't necessary, but at one point I needed that, because yeah. and there was no, no matter what I did, and I just said, you know, Lord, I mean, you're you know who I am, you know I give 150% of whatever I do, you know I look at you. And, you know, I can't let these things continue to bother me. You know, when do we need to do that work for her? We need a gas to be aware. Because if we ignore it, it builds up, builds up to where the heart is hardened. And that's what we don't want to harden heart. We want to keep our hearts so we can receive the Lord constantly. Yeah, amen. So does anyone want to read paragraph B? I'll do that one more. All right. We also see this change in the early church in the first and second century. They took the word seriously and literally when it said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. John 18, 36, and 40. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, pulling down strongholds. 
Second Corinthians 10, 3, 4. Here are some quotes from them on the substance itself. We who formerly murder one another now refrain from making more upon our enemies. Justin Mark Mark. Mark. We have learned not to return blow for blow, nor to go to law with those who plunder and rob us. Instead, even in those who strike us on one side of the face, we offer the other side also. We willingly yield ourselves to the sword. So what war wars would we not be both fit and eager to participate in, even against unequal forces? If in our religion it were not counted better to be slain than to, to slay. To those who inquire of us from where we come or who is our founder, we reply that we have come agreeably to the counsels of Jesus. We have cut down our hostile, insolent, weariness swords into plowshares. We have converted into pruning hooks the spears that we have formerly used in war. But we no longer take up the sword against nation, nor do we live need war, third war anymore. That is because we have become children of peace for the sake of Christ, who is our leader. And like I said in what I went through this week, I had to really work hard at not taking defense right. to combat nature. Oh yeah. And 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 with the Lord, I just asked the Lord for peace in my spirit and show me how. I can love on them in a manner which counteracts everything they come at me with. Right. And, and the result of that is, is, is it took three days of those calming down of their spirits to the point where they, they accepted you know, the yeah. situation for what it was and not looking at me as the you know, one that was responsible for that situation. Yeah. Amen. So it takes a certain grace that it takes a certain grace um, to turn the other cheek, to, to not return, you know, to not do a, an eye for an eye. And we we need to pray and uh, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. But it's not possible. Not not uh not when we partner with the Lord in his heart. Yes, see in my old days I would have been angry and lashed out in verbal language that I wouldn't be proud of. Right. <laughs> would like to sit tongue in cheek. I had to bite my tongue yeah. and say, "Okay, Lord, you know this isn't who I am anymore, so I'm not going to participate." In this. Yeah. Amen. Amen. My question is very simple: this um, mm -hmm. FN or SS and curriculum mm -hmm. and um, or origin or origin. Or, 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 uh, I've seen that curriculum one other time this week, and I are uh, those interpretations of the Bible. Oh or, no, no, he's the, those are all just. Uh, Early church fathers quotes is from the set called the End Time Nicene Fathers. Yep. Um, it's really just the generation right after the apostles, mm -hmm. really um, one one or two generations after, depending on the church father. Um, don't take them at, as a authoritative well, at all. Um, I just think it's valuable to uh, to hear from them to see what they have to say um, because. They are the ones who were discipled by the apostles himself. Um, did someone call them? Okay. Uh, one point about the church fathers is that you can reconstruct the New Testament from their writings because all of the New Testament somewhere is in the writings of the church, early church fathers. This gives us high confidence that what you got in your Bible is true. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, um, comment with what John said, that it takes it takes discernment and um, you know our calling on the Holy Spirit and having discernment to to recognize when how how we should respond to attacks, right. you know, different attacks of the enemy. And you know, if we don't, then we do lash out in our our flesh, you know, the way we want to, and then that right. doesn't that doesn't accomplish, you know, what God wants for us. Yeah, yeah, amen. All right, does anyone want to get the next paragraph? Uh, yes, I believe it. 
So we can see that the most important part of the armor bearer duties lie in the spirit realm. Armor bearing is a ministry of prayer, watchfulness, and intercession. The armor bearer is to prove his sincerity, loyalty, and courage in spirit realm through prayer and intercession. All the physical tasks of the Old Testament armor bearer apply today in the spirit. But what we have learned from the Old Testament based on what we see in the New Testament scriptures and the lives of the early Christians, we are able to identify the duties of a New Testament armor bearer. What was literal warring in the Old Covenant is now spiritual warring in the New Covenant. Yeah, yeah, amen. So, what we find in, in, in the Old is is physical and literal we find in the in the new testament is spiritual and that's not with every case with everything um but it's it's fairly easy to discern how, how to, to go about those things um if we want to go to to uh new testament examples of armor bearing if anyone wants to uh uh, read that paragraph A. John the Baptist. John is one of the new best, one of the best new, new Testament examples of armor bearer. Armor bearer. When one, when the crowds gathered around him and wondered in their hearts if he was the Messiah, he said, "One is coming after him who said was so much greater." Then he that he wasn't even fit to tie his sandals. John said he John said could have taken all the glory from himself if he wanted to, but instead he gave all the glory to Jesus and gave himself to land in life of service. Even when John's disciples saw that Jesus and Nazareth was, was growing strong, growing larger than his. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John 3.30. Out, outwardly, it must look like John got the short end of the stick. He was later imprisoned and beheaded. Yet God doesn't look at the outward like a man, but at the heart. Jesus himself called John the greatest man born of a woman. Luke 7.20. Amen. Amen. So we see with John. John, like outwardly, you think, wow, he 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 kind of really did get those shirt under the stick. The fact that you know he he gave us his life for being in the wilderness for ten years or however long it was, and then he he has this ministry of baptism, so it looks all right for for a while, three and a half years. You know, he's like, all right, I'm starting to to get here, and you know, people are starting to to come to him, and he could have so easily. He could have so easily just, you know, when they, they were thinking he's the Messiah. You know, he might not even said he was a Messiah, but he could have said, you know, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm still pretty awesome. You know, he could have said, he could have gave himself a little bit of something, but he didn't. He, he said, no, it's not me. It's not me. Matter of fact, the one who we're talking about, I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. You know, and, and even when Jesus came to him to baptize him, he's like, I'm the one who should be baptized by you. But Jesus, he said, no, we, we have to do it this way because it's to fulfill the scriptures. You know, and if we have the heart of John the Baptist, we have to realize that if we're walking as an armor bearer, in an armor bearer like spirit as he did, that outwardly, it might not look great because after that, John gets imprisoned. You know, he. You might get in your head if, if you're John, you'd be like, all right, all right. So when he comes, I'll be like his sidekick, and you know, we'll, we'll go, you know, on the road and everything. And um, no, 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 no gospel tour for John. Matter of fact, John's disciples were was getting discouraged because they're like, his, his ministry is doing better than yours. You know, they're looking at the outside, thinking it's a competition, and he's like, he must increase, and I must decrease. 
You know, and, and it's that hard. And you know, being in prison and being beheaded, you know, if the world would look at that and say, you know, that that was a failure. That was a failure. You know, he he gave most of his life to something that didn't didn't produce a lot of fruit. You know, he he got three and a half years and that's it. But here's the thing, God looks at the heart. And he prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah. Was it John the Baptist who was born spirit though? Yes, yes, that's what the scripture tells us. He was he's filled with the spirit from birth. All right, uh, we want to go to, to Mark B. Yeah, I have something. Yeah. Oh, they were cousins, right? Yes, yeah. Jesus then. I've always wondered. Okay, why didn't they know each other? He lived, he lived just in Mark. One who lived in Nazareth and grew up, the other one probably spoke to Bethlehem. But you know, when Elizabeth traveled to see John's mother, yeah. um, and spent all that time, in fact, Mary was really the one who Mary got to see the birth of John the Baptist. If you do the timeline, she was three months pregnant when she left Nazareth. She spent six full months in uh, the hill country, wherever that would be, and then immediately returns. Three so months later. My question is do you suppose when Jesus came to be baptized by John, John actually knew in the flesh who this was? Um, I don't know if it says he recognized him, but he, he definitely knew the spirit because he's the one that descended, you know, the you know, descending on him. Uh, yes. Okay. question. You look at what he was being baptized. Uh, he, he said, uh, you know, I need to be baptized by you, so he recognized who he was. Yeah, before he was baptized. Christ said, no, it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, another thing is, you know, being in our prayers, you, you might get discouraged. Look at John right. the Baptist. He sent his disciples out when he was in prison and asked, are you the one to Christ? Even though he actually witnessed things happen. So you might get discouraged, just don't, you know, don't give up. Right. Um, but it's encouraging to know that Jesus, he didn't see that and say, uh, you know, John's He's, he's backslidden, he's falling away. No, he actually said, no, he's a great man born of woman. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so I think it's, it's he recognized, you know, that uh, we all have shortcomings. And, you know, um, there's actually, there, there's theories that, um, that John was actually doing that so his disciples would know. Um, but, I mean, I don't think the text is, um, Says either way, I think he could come to either conclusion. But uh, regardless of whatever it is, that uh, Jesus himself said he's the greatest man for a woman. And I think that's to his self sacrificed life and to focus solely on the coming and the preparing of the way of Jesus and the repentance of, uh, of people and baptizing them. Um, does anyone want to read uh, Mark, paragraph B? Mark. Mark is one of the most underrated persons in the New Testament. He had a true heart of an armor bearer. It is believed that Mark's gospel was the first to have been written, and if indeed Mark was the first gospel to have been written, Matthew and Luke quickly recognized its value as a source of information in writing their own Gospels. The first person to mention the Gospel of Mark in church history was Matthias, a disciple of John the Apostle, about AD 120 to 130. All right, I, I worded that strange. Um, I didn't mean that he was a, an apostle about that time. It's that, that this is where this what kind of quote could be taking place. Um, so go on. His testimony is important enough to quote in full. Mark was the interpreter of Peter and wrote accurately, but not in order, 
whatever he remembered about the things which were said or done by the Lord. He, Mark, neither heard the Lord nor followed him. But later, as I said, he relied upon Peter, who adapted his teachings to the needs of his hearers without setting forth an orderly account of the Lord's sayings. Therefore, Mark did not err in writing various things as he remembered them, for he made it his first priority not to omit or falsify anything which he heard. And it was written by Papias Eusebius, Church History, 339, 15, yeah, those are the volumes and page numbers. Um, so we see here, uh, Papias. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know who Papias is, he's just a, he's a disciple right after John. Just disciple, one of the disciples of John. So uh, we don't have a lot of writings of his, but this is one of the fragments that was left from um, left by Eusebius, who was like a third or fourth century church historian, and he was quoting uh, Papias right here. And uh, so historically. We know, uh, or at least you don't have to take, again, it's history, so you don't take it as dogmatic, but we have good reason to believe that Mark was Peter's assistant and that he, he helped him while he was preaching to the Gentiles and he helped interpret his message. So he would interpret the stories of Jesus again and again and again, and eventually he, he got to memorize them. And when, when Peter died, Mark said that this has to be this has to be written down so others can hear. So he, he wrote down the account, and it's believed, and, and there are some disputes, but regardless, it, it's believed that he wrote the very first gospel of the four gospels. Now, if that's true, that's that's astounding. That's astounding. And what a heart of an armor bearer to to he has such a desire that the message would go out just just as just as his uh his leader uh you can use pastor or elder or um bishop um but his head that he was so willing to serve and get the message out as peter wanted it you can see that once he he, he passed away he still carried on Peter's message, which is Christ's message. And if you look at the, the Gospel of Mark, it's actually quite funny because it's very like it's it's very character-wise of Peter because you hear so much immediately, straight away. You know all these these things done done at once. Yeah. What's interesting about that is if, if you realize he didn't add or subtract from. Right. Peter had done. Right. In other words, he didn't put his interpretation into it. Yeah. He kept it as, like you said, as accurate as possible. Yeah. And that is <coughs> a lot of people, when they tell a story, they like to add to, you know, over exaggerated, right. make it bigger than it is. But he just he kept to the basic facts that what he knew was right. from Peter. And yeah. he didn't add his own interpretations. Yeah. We, we have a tendency today in the church today to right. our own interpretations, and then it gets all blown out of proportion. <laughs> Well, especially because Mark wasn't wasn't there, as far as I know, uh, being discipled by Jesus hands on. Yeah. So he, he had to, he had to get it secondhand from Peter himself, yeah. but just under the anointing and hearing it again and again and again, it, it got in him. That's fascinating. You know, that he, he was that yeah, way. yeah. It's, it's it's quite it's quite awesome, quite remarkable. Um, and let's go to. Uh, to Barnabas, if anyone wants to, uh, does anyone want to do Barnabas? Uh, paragraph C. All right, so I'll do paragraph C. <laughs> <laughs> Barnabas, his very means, name means son of encouragement, a name given by the apostles, Acts 4 32, to Joseph or Joseph, a Levite in the, the island of Cyprus, who was an early disciple of Christ. So we, we see they had, 
they had this this character in their lives, a new convert. His name was Joseph, and Joseph's not a bad name. And usually, when people get renamed, you see that it's 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 from something that was um, that was bad into uh, meaning wise to a good name, like Jacob. It meant deceiver, um, and he became Israel. Though he wrestled with God, um, and so we we see that this this definition of who the person is. And this disciple saw this person, and something about his life so so inclined them to call him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So it's it's very it's it's very uh, encouraging. To know that uh, that he was an encourager, and that we can have Barnabases in our lives, and we can be Barnabases, um, and that's that's a really really strong key point of an armor bearer is to be encouraging to your leaders and to uh, bring bring forth their message in their heart. Um, we find him in, introduced. Uh, with a newly converted Paul to the uh, to the apostles at Jerusalem, Barnabas was sent to Jerusalem. Acts eleven nineteen uh, verses nineteen through twenty six. When he went to Tarsus to seek Paul, as once specially raised up to preach to the Gentiles. Acts twenty three uh, Acts twenty six seventeen. He brought uh, he brought him to Antioch, and he was sent. And he was sent with him to Jerusalem. On their return, they were ordained by the church for the missionary work uh, and set forth 40 AD. For the first time, Barnabas and Paul enjoyed the title of the dignity of apostles, lowercase a, only the, the 12 get the capital A. Um, the, first, uh, the first missionary journey in his, uh, in relating. Uh, and related, sorry, related in returning to Antioch, they were sent in 8050 with some of the others to Jerusalem. Afterwards, they partnered uh, and took, Bar and took uh, sorry, and Barnabas took Mark, his cousin, if you guys didn't know that, Barnabas and Mark are cousins, and sailed to uh, uh, Cy Cyprius, the, the native island. Here, the scriptures notice. Uh, here, the scripture notices of him seeks. The epistle of Barnabas is believed to have, be, uh, have been written in the early uh, second century, but is debated if he is the author. So there's there's a writing called the Epistle of Barnabas, and it was actually debated on whether or not it should be canon. Um, but uh, because there was debate, it wasn't. Clear whether or not it was Barnabas, they, they left it out. Um, Barnabas was a true encouragement and a helpful co worker in Christ and a true honor bearer. So we see Barnabas, is he not only talked the talk, he not only spoke encouragement, but he lived encouragement. Is he actually did the hard work? And you know, it, it's funny because. Going out and doing all these things is Paul was really the, the one that people more gravitated to and, and saw as this you know big preacher man. But but you know a lot of these you know you find you wouldn't be able to do you know if, if you go on on a mission you know and I mean maybe God would have granted grace but how much more of an increase you know one brings a flight a thousand two ten thousand. You know, and you don't have to be the main person to bring an increase. You know, yeah. um, did you have? To? No. Okay. All right. So, um, does anyone want to read Jesus? Paragraph D. Even Jesus himself walked in the spirit of an armor bearer. How was Jesus an armor bearer? Who was he as an armor bearer too? You may be asking yourself, Jesus was an armor bearer to God, the Father himself. Jesus always submitted to the Father in everything he did. Philippians 2 shows us this powerfully. 
Do nothing out of selfish conviction or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I have to say that's one of my favorite passages about Christ. It is so moving. And after you read it, you can't help but be humble. Yeah. You know, if the God of the universe who had no limits, it says he, he had the same nature, the same, the same quality as God. Like he was, he had the fullness of of the God. He had the fullness of it. He, he was no less God than, than God the Father. And yet, he, because of his desire, he says, Father, I desire that they would be with me where I am. Because of that desire, because of that deep love, and he knew we were in trouble, he came down. He stepped down. I just want to read it again, because it's so good. <laughs> Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain consent. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And this is what Christ did because it, it goes to say, do not look to your own interests, but the interests of, the, of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who was being the very nature of God. Do not consider equality with God is something to be used to its own advantage. Other translations, like the King, King James, that says he didn't count it robbery. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing: is is if God, if God would think like a like we do, like a person, if we ever get robbed of our privileges, or or we we don't, he didn't he didn't lose them. He just didn't he just didn't use them. It says he emptied himself. So here he had these, these divine privileges, but he purposely restrained himself. And he walked in obedience to the Father. Mm -hmm. how, how humble, not only did he walk in obedience, he didn't count it as robbery. He didn't, he didn't think that he was being robbed. He didn't think, oh, this isn't fair. You know, I'm, I'm still, I'm just as... I'm just as much divine as the Father is. I'm still fully divine. I don't know why my divine privilege is, but he, he restrained himself. He was a man of restraint. He humbled himself. Who yes. being the very nature of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the nature of a servant. Being made in the human likeness, and being found, uh, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So he not only became a man, like describing a king becoming a peasant isn't even the best analogy because the, the parallels are are infinitely higher than that. That's the best parallel we can come up with, is a, is a, is a rich king to, to a homeless person. But the reality is God is infinitely higher than a king. And he steps down to not only, he didn't become like a rich man, he became a poor Jewish boy. And he served others when others could have been serving him. And he made himself susceptible to death, not only death, 
but a criminal's death on the cross, a death that we deserve. We experienced every right. start from the enemy that right. we experienced in the past. Everyone, even John, got the doubt, yeah. doubt the start of doubt. You know? Yeah. But Jesus yeah. never ever. Yeah, that's good. One thing I always, yeah. I, I, I got the one, one thing I, I think in scenarios all the time, you know, I, I just take lots of scripture out and try to put myself in that place, wherever it is, you know. And as, as we look at the, the apostles, as they, they walked with Christ for three and a half years, and then probably the last year or so, he started giving hints that he's going to be crucified. Right. You know, as Joan was three days and three nights in the, the, the whale's belly, yeah. so shall the Son of Man. And, and, and little little scriptures and, and, and hints like that all the way through, but it seemed to the apostles that that stuff went right over their heads. You know, they, and even though he would quote uh, uh, Isaiah 52 and 53, right. they didn't get it. You know, yeah. and then you know watching him raise the dead, work multiple miracles. Yeah. John says that uh, there's not enough books to even right. write down what the guy did in three and a half years. And to watch him go to trial and be beaten and, and uh, take him to the cross and die in the worst death, they say, that, that, that man has come up with. Yeah. And how those guys scattered after that, yeah. it, it had to blow away. I mean, I, I just can't. Yeah. I, I think I, I'll put myself in, you know, maybe one of the other possible lesser ones, but. Uh, uh, but he told them, I'm coming back, you know, right. and, but after seeing what they saw, that had to devastate. Yeah, yeah, amen. And you even see Christ say, it's, it's better that I go. Sure. It's better, you know, and how mind-blowing is that? Because we all say, oh, how awesome it would be to be with Christ. And it was awesome for them. But he said, it's actually better because I'm going to empower you with the Spirit. Um, yeah, uh, being made an appearance from man, he humbled himself, even becoming obedient, even to the death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name of every name. That is, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. So here, we have the God of the universe and the soul. What excuse do we have to exalt ourselves? Yeah, right. The way the way the the kingdom works, the kingdom of God is the upside down kingdom. If you want to be exalted, you have to humble yourself. Yes. You have to become a lowly servant. You have to become like a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the spirit of an armor bearer too. Is that we're learning? Armor bearer is it's not the flashy thing. It's it's service. It's serving. And it it's very a lot of times it's unthankful. You know, um, it's not always the greatest thing to be to be the, the teacher and the, the person leading worship because scripture says you're held to a higher accountability. You're held to a higher accountability if you do this. Mm -hmm. You know, so and to be to be honest, you know, it's it's made me it's made me question, you know, um, whether or not I should do it because I, I, <laughs> I want to hear the, the words of good and faithful servant. Um, yes? Um, you know, I kind of have a question about yeah. the very last um, two sentences mm -hmm. that at the name of Jesus, everybody, we shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, tongue acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. Um, does that mean every time they hear that name, those that are under the earth, mm -hmm. so to speak, are they always acknowledging that Christ is Lord, or is that going to be after? Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's definitely going to be a moment that happens. I don't know if it's continuous, um, 
And those under the earth, I don't know if they're, they, they do it rejoicingly. Um, there, could be, uh, there could be horrible regrets um, as confessing through, through tears um, with weeping and gnashing teeth. Um, but I don't know as far as like timeline was. Um, I would, I would, my, I suppose, I mean, if I was to guess, I would say um, after the millennial kingdom um, and Christ's return and we walk into eternity um, and heaven and earth become one. Um, that's, that's where I would think that would happen, but I don't know. It, it doesn't like, it's not like this passion just gives you a timeline. I, that's just what I, it seems to fit in my understanding of, of the word. Um, does anyone want to read the last paragraph? Paragraph E. Even though the word armor bearer is not used in the New Testament, we can see from the scriptures that the attitude and spirit of an armor bearer is found throughout the pages of the New Covenant. Here are some references to help you discover and study for yourself the proper attitude and character of a New Testament armor bearer. Matthew 18, 14, John 15, 13, Ephesians 6, 5 and 6, Philippians 2, 3 through 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, and 1 Peter 5, 5 and 2 to 1. Amen, amen. All right, so uh, we're, we're going to uh, close. Um, if anyone wants to close us in prayer. All right, so I'll close us in prayer. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. For your will, Lord Jesus, God, uh, we pray, God, that you would help us to come on with those, that you would help us see the world as you see it, Lord Jesus, God, that we would be able to, to have a heart, the same heart that you've given to our leaders, Lord Jesus, God, that we would, Lord, as long as that's God-given, as long as that's god breathed that's given from you, Lord Jesus, God, help us help them carry it out, Lord. May we be servants in your eyes, Lord, because you say best is in your service, Lord. So we thank you for all these things. We have an anointing to worship you and to love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and with all our strength. Lord, and that you will be glorified through our service and through our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Yeah.